everybody, I am Abby Elizabeth, and this is the Earthen Vessels channel. This is a channel for Christian women, but anyone is welcome to listen. Glory be to God. Glory be to God, our Heavenly Father, who has given us understanding in his holy word. Verily I say unto you that the scripture saith that those who seek the Lord understand all things. And where we seek the Lord is in his holy word. The word of God, if you speak English, is the King James Version of the Holy Bible. Hallelujah. I was asked a couple of questions recently, and I would like to begin to address them. The first thing I'd like to say, though, is that if you want to know the Lord Jesus Christ, the way to know him is not to watch videos on YouTube or anywhere else. The way to know him is to seek him in his holy word. And verily, I can point you in the right direction. But the reason Jesus Christ came was to save people from their sins and restore them into a relationship with the living God. And once we've been saved by being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, which is for the remission of our sins, we're filled with the spirit of the living God, and thereafter we are in relationship with him. One of the questions that I received, which is a very compelling question, I might say, is how do we prepare for the wedding? We who are Christians, and of course this message is for Christians, it's not for people who profess to know the Lord Jesus Christ but have not obeyed his gospel. This is for people, this particular video is for those of you, my sisters, who have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ and entered into a blood covenant with him by being baptized in his name. This is the way of salvation under the new covenant, and there is no other way. Glory be to God. So how is it that we prepare for the wedding? Another question that I received, which is also a compelling question, is in Revelation 21. It talks about that he that overcometh has a right to enter into the kingdom. And we're going to get to these passages in just a moment. I'm just presenting the questions to you. And I was asked the question, how do we overcome? How do we overcome? How do we walk in such a way as to be pleasing unto our master? Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Well, one thing that we want to understand from the beginning, and let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 is that a bride, a bride, a physical human woman who's a bride is a picture of the relationship between the church of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ. So let's turn together in our Holy Bible. And if you can't read the Bible with me right now, I urge you to go back and look at these passages later. Because verily, if somebody's reading the word of God to you, it might go in one ear and out the other. Verily, it won't stick. The way to really get the word of God in you is to let it come in through your eyes and consider it in your heart. Hallelujah. So Ephesians chapter 5, let's read here starting verse 31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Hallelujah. So here we can see that the relationship between Jesus Christ and Christians is one of marriage, and we are one flesh with him. And that has a lot of meaning to it, and we're going to get into this in just a moment. But let's read now in verse 33. It says, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. So if we want to prepare for the wedding feast as a Christian, we want to reverence our husband, who is Jesus Christ. Whether or not you're married in the flesh or not, you are still betrothed as a Christian unto Jesus Christ, and your walk of faith is between you and him. And what I would say to you is, 
is that each and every one of us needs to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. So when we are a Christian, we want to reverence our husband. And the way that we show reverence is we do what he said. Jesus Christ said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So there's a few commandments that we as Christians in particular want to remember and obey. And the first one that I want to go over is in Matthew chapter 28. And let's begin in verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now there are some who will tell you that because you're female, this does not apply to you. And verily, this serves the serpent very well. Someone who has told you that is deceived and deceiving you. And verily, if you believe them, and you are silent when it comes to your testimony of Jesus Christ, you will not enter the kingdom of God. Now, the way a woman testifies about the Lord Jesus Christ is different than the way a man does. She testifies to her children. She educates her children. She lives in holiness. When people ask her why her head is covered or why she's dressed modestly, she answers them from the scripture. Verily, she goes to the people in her family and she visits them with kindness. And some of them will see her kindness and inquire about the changes. Because what I would say unto you is this, my sisters, when we're baptized in Jesus' name and our sins are remitted, we change. We have been made holy. We have been washed in the blood of the Lamb and we're not the same person anymore. Therefore, when we're walking in the world after we've been saved from our sins, we're going to get attention from people. They're going to see our veil. Some people will mock us. Some people will mock us for covering our bodies with modesty. And some will be curious. Some will see us reading our Bible, perhaps on a park bench or on a bus or somewhere else. They will see that and they will inquire what we're reading and then we will testify unto them about the Lord Jesus Christ who saved us. We do not stand on a street corner and proclaim the word of God with a megaphone. We don't get up in front of a congregation of saints and start teaching. However, we do teach our younger sisters if we're an older woman and we understand some things maybe about chastity or about keeping at home. We teach our children and we minister, which means we serve our husband. If a woman has a husband who doesn't believe, she serves him with grace and with wisdom. She doesn't attempt to teach him. Rather, she exemplifies what a Christian is. By her chaste conversation, she wins the heart of her husband without the word of God. This is written in 1 Peter chapter 3. So a godly woman is meek and quiet. She's gentle. She's got the law of kindness in her mouth. She speaks wisdom unto people. And she testifies about the salvation that is in Jesus Christ. And what I would say to you, my sister, is that, is that you must do this. There's no getting out of it. It's not okay to say, oh, well, my husband's doing that and I'm cooking his dinner. That's not enough. You see, when we're born again of the word of God, that seed brings forth life in us when we're baptized in Jesus' name and filled with his spirit. Our belly pours forth living water. And if we don't allow that to happen, if we abdicate that responsibility, we are not going to be proven faithful. And this is what we do to overcome. And this is what we do also to please the king and be ready when he cometh. Pardon me, in chapter 1 and verse 14. These are the people that were in the upper room awaiting the gift of the Holy Ghost. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women 
and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. So if you read the rest of this passage, you will see how it is that the people of God were in one accord in the upper room awaiting the Holy Spirit, waiting the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now in verse um, 4 of chapter 2, let's read. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So men and women both spoke with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now let's go back a little bit and let's go to Acts chapter 1 to understand what the gift of the Holy Ghost is for. Starting in verse 7, Jesus Christ is speaking here to the disciples. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So the gift of the Holy Ghost is to give us power to testify about the salvation that is in Jesus Christ. And this same Holy Ghost was poured out upon both men and women. And both men and women are commanded to testify about the salvation that they've received in Jesus Christ. Now, let's go to verse 17, or actually let's read in verse 18 here. Now here Peter is referring to a prophecy in, in the book of Joel, and here we read something that applies to us. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and they shall prophesy. So here we're reading about a prophecy in the Old Testament about what would happen after Jesus Christ came into the world, lived a sinless life, laid down his innocent life at the cross, was crucified, buried for three days, and was resurrected on the third day. And then, 50 days later, after the resurrection on the day of Pentecost, he was glorified. And when he was glorified, his spirit was poured out. So the spirit of Jesus Christ is the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is not the gift of tongues. The Holy Ghost is the spirit of the living God that comes to abide in a Christian, be it male or female. And the reason this gift comes is so that we can be ambassadors for Jesus Christ, be we male or female. It says here, let's read this again now, and on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Now again, the way a woman prophesies is different than the way a man does. So I want to go over this very briefly. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And what I would say is that a lot of people are mistaken about what it means to prophesy. They think it means to predict the future. Many women these days think they have a dream about something and that means it's going to happen. Many women these days get a visitation from a spirit and they think it's Jesus Christ or they think that, that it's an angel. And they speak things that they think are in the future. And verily, I say unto you that this is not what is meant in Acts chapter 2. That yes, sometimes we understand something that is going to happen in the future. But it always lines up with the word of God. And Jesus Christ said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And so if you're speaking something that is not in alignment with the word of God, you're speaking an error. If you've had a dream, it's likely because you watched a movie or you heard somebody say something or you're going through something. And it very likely is not something that should be put, for example, on YouTube as what's going to happen next. You see, prophecy is to speak the word of God. 
To prophesy means to testify about the truth in the word of God. So with a woman, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, let's read here in verse 5. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. So a woman who is talking about the word of God and her hair is showing is not someone that you should listen to. Because she's dishonoring God. You see, it says here, every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. And in the scripture just before this, we read that the head of the woman is the man and the head of the man is Christ and the head of Christ is God. So it's an order of subjection. So a woman who prays or prophesies with her beautiful hair exposed is dishonoring God by making her flesh and her beauty the issue. So my sisters, this is one thing we want to understand. Now, prophesying. Let's go back now to Acts. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to clearly establish with you from the word of God that what prophecy is, what we're speaking, is the word God. It's not some opinion that we have because we had a nightmare or something. And I'm not saying at all that someone can't have a dream and it come from God. What I'm saying, though, is that when we are filled with the Holy Spirit of the living God, we're testifying about Jesus Christ. So let's go to Acts chapter 2, and let's read what happened after the Holy Spirit was poured out. And let's read here, starting with verse 6. Now, when this was noised abroad, so here the, the apostles and the men and the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, are all speaking in an unknown tongue, a tongue that they didn't learn and that they don't understand. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how we hear every man in our own tongue wherein we were born. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews, and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues. Now listen, this is the point. The wonderful works of God. To prophesy, my sisters, means to talk about the wonderful works of God. And when God poured out his spirit upon the servants and handmaidens, it was so that we could do so, so that we could do so. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's go to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. And read about what it means to be faithful. Start in verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him. So the way we overcome the serpent and the power of sin and death and hell is as follows. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. You see, 
a Christian serves the everlasting kingdom of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said, my kingdom is not of this world, else would my servants fight. The way that we serve the master is to walk as he walked, to do as he did. This is written in 1 John chapter 2. That we walk as he walked, I believe it's verse 6. We walk as the master walks, and that means that we're willing to walk in faith and tell the truth, even if people hate us and they kill us. You see, the scripture saith, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. The way the blood of Jesus Christ is applied to us is when we're baptized in his name and filled with his spirit. This is written in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 8. So let's read this so that this is clear because so many people don't understand. They think they said a sinner's prayer and now they're covered by the blood and that's incorrect. Jesus said there is one way to enter the kingdom of God. Unless a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. First John chapter 5 and verse 8. And these are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. So if you want to be covered by the blood, you have to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Any other baptism doesn't remit your sins. And remission of sins comes by blood. Obviously, we can't go back and get buried in the blood of the Lamb. And the way God provided for his people to enter into the new covenant with him was by water and spirit, by being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, which is exactly what Peter preached on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out. The spirit of the living God was not poured out when Jesus Christ was on the cross talking to the thief on the cross. Of course not. He was still living. The blood had not yet been poured out. The new covenant began when Jesus Christ not only had poured out his blood and been buried and resurrected, but when he was glorified 50 days later, that's when this happened, when he poured out his spirit upon all flesh that were his people, servants, and handmaids, not the whole world. So I know I said all flesh, so pardon me. I want to be absolutely clear here that when we become a Christian and we receive the Holy Ghost, that is particular to those who are serving Jesus Christ in this time. We have to continue in the word of God. We have to be faithful. And that means that the word that brought forth life in us needs to come forth from our mouth. And if we don't obey this, we will not be found faithful. As a dear brother often says, there are no quiet Christians. And while a woman has a meek and quiet spirit, she is not quiet about the hope that is in her. She must testify. She must. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. So how do we prepare as a bride to go to the kingdom with Jesus Christ? Well, we do what he said because we want to please him. We continue in his word. He said, if ye would be my disciples, continue in my word. My mother and my brethren are these that hear the word of God and do it. We are good. We are obedient. We show our love unto our husband, our master, our savior, and our Lord by obeying his commandments. This is what we want to be doing when Jesus Christ returns, and no man knows the day or the hour. Let's go to Psalm 116, verse 5. Psalm 
116 and verse 5. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low, and he helped me. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. So we remember what Jesus Christ did for us. You see, to talk about with our mouth the wonderful works of God is to talk about how we've been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ and how we've been delivered from the power of darkness. And this is the responsibility of the bride, be ye male or female. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. So while we're here, we walk before the Lord. I believed and therefore have I spoken. I believed and therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are liars. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? So what do we give to the Lord Jesus Christ for what he has done for us? What do we render unto God? I will take the cup of salvation and will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. You see, to be proven faithful, to be proven worthy, to overcome all things and have a right to enter in to the kingdom means to, means to, testify of the Lord Jesus Christ even unto death whenever that death happens to be no matter how it comes to pass and precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints O Lord truly I am I pardon me truly I am thy servant I am thy servant and the son of thy handmaid thou hast loosed my bonds I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of thee, O Jerusalem. Praise ye the Lord. So we speak the word of God, we testify of the hope that is in us, and we praise the Lord. So I want to close now. Let's go to Romans. Romans chapter 10. And we'll read here verses 9 and 10. But before I read this, I just want to make mention of the fact that the book of Romans, the letter to the Romans, was written to the saints at Rome. It was not written to the sinners in the whole world. And this passage is about how we as Christians prove ourselves faithful starting verse 9. Well, let's start in verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh unto thee. The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. So we have faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. We have faith in the truth of his gospel. We remember the gospel of Jesus Christ and that we have obeyed it and the promises that are given unto us because we have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Revelation chapter 21, verses 7 
and 8. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake with, which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. My sisters, we have to overcome our tendency to be shy or our tendency to be fearful about speaking to people. And while a godly woman does not stand on a street corner with a megaphone or exalt herself to be leading something in a church meeting, wherein she would learn in silence with all subjection, both men and women have been given the Holy Spirit for the purpose of testifying about the salvation that is found in Jesus Christ. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. If you have not obeyed this gospel, gospel, I urge you to write to me. My email is in the description box under the video. Is God calling you? Well, praise the Lord. And if God has saved you by the power of the blood of the Lamb, then it's time to stop being silent about the hope that is in us. Because verily I say unto you, if we don't testify about the salvation that we have found, we will not make it into the kingdom. Glory be to God. I look forward to hearing from you, and may your day be blessed as you ponder these things. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.